Okay, good morning, everyone. Thanks for uh, joining us. Uh, today, I thought I'd just give you an update of what we intend to do for the reopening of our economy uh, with respect to the manufacturing and production sector especially. I won't go into the details that were covered yesterday at the Ministry of Task Force uh, conference uh, media briefing yesterday because they have already done so for the rest of the social sector. Okay. So maybe I'll just cover briefly three sets of issues, then I'll take questions from you. Uh, first is to give you a sense of uh, how we have arrived at this place. Uh, second is uh, where we are now in terms of our economic uh, production capabilities. And third is how do we intend to go forward in a safe and sustainable way. Now, so let me uh, first start with uh, how we have arrived at the circuit breaker measures. Now, if you have noticed over the last uh, couple of weeks, we have done this progressively in a graduated and calibrated manner. Uh, we chose to do this in this way so that there's no sudden uh, change in the posture overnight that will cause disruption to our global supply chains. Uh, so prior to the circuit breaker measures, we have actually reduced our act work activities on site by about 70%, with most people working from home. And this is likely to continue even beyond the circuit breaker measures. So the first part is that in arriving at where we are today, we started with the work from home, which has decreased uh, on-site activity by about 70%. However, we have maintained all our essential services and also manufacturing to support the global supply chains that require on-site work. So the 30% of people who are on site continue to provide essential services and to supply the global supply uh, and to maintain the connectivity with the global supply chains. So this systematic approach that we have taken has uh, reduced any unintended consequences of a disruption to the global supply chain. And it has also helped us to avoid uh, fear and panic uh, breaking out that cause a greater unpredictability to the business sector. Uh, so now going forward, uh, we, have, we are now in the circuit breaker measures and uh, enhanced circuit breaker measures. We have brought our on-site activities down from about 20 plus percent to about 17 percent. Uh, however, this 17 percent has continued to allow us to maintain all our essential services and also to maintain our support for all the global production chains and also the global connectivity uh, in terms of our airport and port operations. And we have, uh, and we continue, and we intend to continue to do this now. So for example, for all the precision manufacturing, global manufacturing, biomedical, petrochemical sectors, and their accompanying supply chains have all continued to function during the circuit breaker measures. And we'll continue to work with all the major companies to make sure that such uh, critical economic activities continue to be uh, available. We have also not imposed any export bans in recognition of the role that we play for the global supply chain. Uh, we will continue to fulfill our responsibilities, not just only to our people, but also to the international partners who have put faith and their investment in our system. Now, let me go to the third part, which is the beyond the circuit breaker uh, period. What do we intend to do? We want to make sure that we balance the safety uh, of our people together with sustainable operations. I think the key word is uh, to have sustainable operations. Many countries are looking for ways to restart their economy progressively in a safe and sustainable ways. And we also intend to do this now. Our working assumption beyond the circuit breaker measure must be this that we continue to need to maintain our vigilance because if there's any lapse in our focus, then we might risk a relapse of the situation or a flare up. And if so, we must have measures to be able to contain, to detect them quickly and to contain the situation. So as we progressively uh, reopen up the production of our economy, we need to be able to detect quickly and isolate effectively. Uh, so this is the consideration of how we want to do. Now, so these are the steps that we intend to do for the progressive uh, reopening of our economy and also the restart of the production system. The first part is that for those who are able to work from home, 
we expect them to continue to work from home for the foreseeable future. Uh, many people have gotten used to the use of the internet platform for meetings, coordinations, and for work that doesn't require for on-site activities, they will pretty much continue. And this forms the bulk of our economy. There will be some changes to this because some people are getting used to uh, not having to be on site so frequently. And I think uh, that will also help to reduce the demand on our transport load. So this will continue to be the bulk of it. Then the second part, I come to the part about the manufacturing and the production activities. Uh, we will need to make sure that we put in place what we call the safe working environment measures and also the safe cohorting measures beyond work. Let me explain and talk about the safe working environment measures first. Uh, we are going to encourage our companies uh, starting now uh, that we have to start the work now to prepare ourselves for the resumption. And that means that we have to put in place now at the, all the factories and companies that there are safe distancing measures, there are safe rest areas, there's cohorting for business continuity, there's the use of a technology solutions to track and trace, and also to do the necessary testings for the higher risk groups. So these are what we call the safe working environment measures. At the same time, we are also uh, asking our companies to work with us to have safe cohorting beyond work. And I think whether is it this pandemic or beyond, this will be good business continuity measures. Uh, so for example, companies and management must take responsibility to advise their workers to not mix and maintain the social cohorting discipline beyond work. Uh, so that employees in different cohorts, in different shifts, different work sites, uh, do not mix and interact outside work. Uh, this will be critical for us because if there should be a flare up or a case in any one particular group, we can quickly isolate that group and allow the rest of the work to continue. So for the uh, foreign workers in Singapore, the companies will also put in measures to monitor their living conditions and uh, they should also use the same philosophy of having the business continuity measures applied to the workers, whether they are locals, or foreigners and this is good practice for all the companies so likewise they should minimize interactions outside of work to maintain the cohort discipline within their own company structure uh, at the same time there will be a stepping up of all the increased uh, cleanliness and hygiene standards for the companies and the workplaces especially for the high uh, touch area so with this safe uh, measures, safe working environment measures and safe cohorting measures, we think we'll be able to progressively uh, restart many of the production activities that have taken a backseat for the last two weeks. Now for us, I want to emphasize that we are not focused on the numbers, we are taking a conditions and outcome-based approach to this. So we encourage companies to start preparing now and once the conditions are met, then uh, EDB, ESG, and the rest of the economic agencies will be able to work with them to restart their operations. Uh, so we encourage all firms to use this time from now till the uh, 11th of May to prepare themselves, put in place the necessary measures so that beyond the 11th of May, we can all uh, get ready when the conditions allow. Right? And we'll continue to work closely with our trade associations and chambers and also the companies to and, uh, and the businesses to engage them on some of these to adopt beyond the uh, current situation. And these measures we think will be sustainable for the long haul for us to have both safe uh, operations and also sustainable operations. Uh, last but not least, I would like to say that we do have to remain vigilant the fight is far from over. Uh, we are always very cautious that we do not want to allow any case to cause a uh, cluster to develop or to flash over to other communities. So this is not something that we have to do alone. We have also to work with like-minded partners uh, in our companies and other countries to make sure that we do not have this uh, recurring waves of uh, infection. Uh, so we will not be able to open some 
of the social entertainment outlets, but we'll focus on our manufacturing capacities and production capabilities first. We'll make sure that we maintain the connectivity for all our air, land and sea links, not just for Singapore, but also for the region and the global supply chains. Uh, sectors that allow us to trade with the world and access critical supplies will progressively restart first. So overall, we are confident that our foundations and the fundamentals remain sound. And while we have to make adjustments and think of a post-COVID-19 situation, we are confident that we have the means and we have the capabilities to see through this. And uh, our partners can have confidence that we will fulfill our obligations to the international community and work together with them to progressively reopen our uh, economy uh, in tandem with the rest. So finally, I think we start to prepare now. Okay, we start to prepare now so that we can prepare to start from the 12th of May. I'm happy to take your questions. Maybe you just uh, wave your hand and then we will come to you and then we take a couple of questions and then we do it as a group. Uh, Aradana? Hi, from... thank, you, thank you, Minister. It's Aradana from Reuters News. Two questions from me. Have you identified some of the sectors that you would like to see opening up from May 12th, provided they put in all the measures that you have that you've outlined. And a uh, second question is, we have an outlook for Singapore GDP of negative one to negative 4%. Um, do, you, do you have an estimate of how much that will change? Because uh, the central bank has warned that it would be lower, the contraction could be lower than that. Okay, so uh, sectors, the sectors that we prioritize to work on first and also the outlook for the GDP, is that correct? Yes, yes, yes sir. Okay. Uh, I'll, I'll answer them in due course. Yeah. Vincent, today. Hi, uh, I just wanted to check. Um, you know, PM mentioned that there's a hidden reservoir of cases, so there will always be a risk after May 12 if community cases are not at zero. So, could you comment why the government is taking this risk of gradually easing these measures instead of waiting for it to go to zero? Is that something that you would prefer? Okay. Yes. Tiffany, straight times. Hi, uh, I have three questions. Uh, the I first is, uh, what are some of the benchmarks for the resumption of economic activity? Uh, and how do you expect the number of workers returning to the workplace to ramp up from the current 15%? Second question is um, on travel. So you mentioned recently that Singapore and some other countries have agreed to facilitate the resumption of uh, essential cross-border travel. Could mm -hmm. you elaborate on which sectors and personnel this would involve as well as uh, when restrictions generally for uh, the public would, would relax for inbound and outbound travel? Uh, mm -hmm. And the last question is on some key events coming up. So has there been any decision made on what form NDP will take this year as well as whether um, F1 will, will proceed this year? Thank you. Uh, hi, yeah, so uh, you yes. talked about the cohorting of, of um, workers when they go back to work, right? Would this also cover the migrant workers in construction sector? Okay, yes, thank you. And we take one more, yeah, yeah. Sure, Hi, uh, Mini Hi, Minister Isa Xuemi from the CCTV. And yes. I have a one question. Now the global oil market price is dropped down very sharply. And does it did it affect the Singapore economic? And how do you, uh, you the global oil market? The price oh, is the oil uh, market. Yes, yes, it is a it's a drop down sharply. And does it affect it Singapore economic? And how did it you to deal with it? And see if there's any other questions. Okay. Uh, first questions on the sectors, as I've mentioned, uh, we do have some priority for the sectors. Uh, for example, those that are closely intertwined with the global supply chains, for example, biopharma, petrochemicals, these are required for the functioning of the global supply chains. Uh, this will be one of the sectors that uh, we will prioritize uh, 
actually for just to put on record, actually these sectors uh, did not stop. We are able to continue to function and continue to provide the services to the global supply chains uh, even during the circuit breaker measures. But certainly many of the measures that we want to put in place for the sustainable operations will apply to this sector. So this is one of them. Uh, for manufacturing <coughs> will be another sector, as a, especially uh, acquisition manufacturing. So this is another example of the sectors that we will prioritize. So that's just to give you a sense of uh, priority. A second question is on the GDP outlook. At this point in time, I think uh, the situation is very fluid. And as I mentioned in a recent interview before, uh, instead of making projections in a very fluid environment, what we are most concerned is to make sure that the package of help schemes that we have is delivered and well executed on the ground. And that remains our focus at this point in time. So I will not uh, give any specific number at this point in time, but suffice to say that we are making sure that whatever measures we have rolled up uh, from the budget schemes, we'll continue to make sure that they are well executed. Uh, <coughs> Jun Sen, you mentioned about the potential hidden reservoir. Uh, this is something that every country has to have at the back of their mind, that there might be cases that have not been detected, and if we are not careful, uh, they can form new clusters, which is why many of the countries who have progressively started work will also need measures to make sure that they have a wide spread uh, background detection system, and once any cases are de detected, they have to quickly isolate and treat them and prevent them from becoming a bigger cluster. So that is the approach that I think most countries who want to resume work will have to undertake. And until we find a vaccine or a new way to uh, cure the disease, I think this will be a good working assumption for us to never be complacent. I don't think any country would be able at this point in time, based on the current scientific uh, knowledge, will be able to say that the virus is uh, totally eradicated uh, uh, from their community. Uh, but every country who are a very low infection rate, continue to maintain a very uh, high state of vigilance. I think that's a good working assumption. Uh, for Tiffany, uh, the resumptions, uh, so I mentioned just now, we are at about 17% of the workers. Uh, progressively, we will resume to perhaps uh, more than that, but we are not focused on the numbers. We are focused on the safe working conditions. So progressively, company by company, we'll work with them to put in place the safe uh, working measures, the safe reporting measures, so that they can restart their operations on a sustainable basis. Uh, on the travel resumptions, yes, we have uh, discussed this issue with my counterparts from uh, UK, Australia, New Zealand, Canada, and also uh, in place the planning and the discussion on how we can resume essential travel. And this is likely to start with the essential business travel. Uh, this will require us to have a coordination on the standards of uh, health checks for mutual assurance. It will require us to have a system to uh, track and trace uh, in case there is an uh, uh, infected person. So we are preparing the groundwork. So like what we ask the companies to do, we are starting the preparations now so that when the time is right, we can then recommence the essential business travel. Uh, I won't comment on the NDP. I think Ministry of Defense will, uh, Minister Ming Hen will make announcements uh, subsequently when they are ready to do so. Uh, uh, they're talking about the cohorting of workers. Yes, I've mentioned during my uh, short brief shut up date just now, the cohorting of workers will apply to all workers. That includes uh, locals and that also includes the uh, foreign workers who are uh, staying across the island uh, because it's just good practice for business continuity. Uh, last one on the oil market, yes, there's a. It's not so much the sharp drop in the oil prices per se. I think what everybody around the world is concerned is the volatility of the oil market. Uh, I think we have to look beyond the first order effect. Many people will say that the first order effect is whether the oil prices go up or down and whether it benefits the oil exporter or importer. But I think there's a second order effect, which is uh, 
more important for the medium to long term. The volatility in the oil market does not do the sector any good because it does not allow the people involved, the stakeholders involved to plan for the long haul and to make the necessary investments for the long haul. So what we hope to see is not so much uh, whether it's just going up or down, it's whether there is some predictability to allow long-term investment to occur over time for the oil sector. Now, the second point I want to highlight is that if you understand the uh, oil market and the refining process, you will know that the input that goes in to the refineries come up with various types of uh, output. Uh, it could include, for example, jet fuel, it could include the uh, gas that we use for our cars, and it could include lubricants and so forth. Uh, scientifically, there is a certain proportion which the input will be refined into the various outputs. What we are concerned with is the imbalance in the demand for the outputs because some sectors, the demand remains stable. Some sectors, for example, jet fuel, the demand has uh, dropped very sharply. Now, because of the imbalance in the demand, it will also affect the production of the various products in their various proportions. So that instability, that volatility is also harming the world's economy. So these are the second order effects that I think we need to be careful with, uh, just beyond the oil price going up or down and the immediate impact. Okay, so maybe we take another round of uh, questions. Tai uh, from Channel 8 News. May you use English so that because you're international media, so they may not be able to understand you. You have used in, uh, Chinese and I'll translate it into English. <笑><笑>不是,就是部长,因为我们中文媒体希望可以用你的华文的那个访谈,所以可以讲几句中文的吗? <笑> Uh, well, the word key. Okay, I want to ask the question is because just now Minister said that um, once um, there are more sectors resume their work, right? Meaning more workers will be going back to the work premises. So uh, there will be some uh, measures will be in place, for example, the safe distance and safe resting areas. And there are some necessary testing for those high risk groups. So could you share with us which are the high risk groups you expected that needed to do the testing besides of uh, nursing homes and those healthcare frontline staff. Mm, thank you. Okay. Okay. Michelle, CNA. Michelle. Hi, Lynn. I have three broad questions. The first is on uh, businesses in the Singapore. In Singapore, will that be more help for them that? For those that take longer to reopen, for example, those in the entertainment sector. The second question is on aviation. You, you speak slowly on your first question. You repeat your oh. first question. Sure. Uh, will there be more help for businesses that take longer to reopen, for example, those in the entertainment sector versus those in the manufacturing and production sector? The second question is on aviation. To what extent is the government willing to back SIA given that it is a strategic sector um, and we're seeing that this impact is going to be prolonged. The third is on tourism, given that ASEAN has been uh, promoting regional tourism, are there any updates to that um, effort given that each ASEAN country is a different stage of the pandemic? So how do we make sure that these um, containment measures that all ASEAN countries take are of a similar benchmark also. City from Kyoto News. Hello, hi. Uh, my name is uh, yeah, City from Kyoto News. Minister, uh, may I just have a sense of, um, uh, you know, I understand you, may, you mentioned we're not focused on the numbers, but can I just have a sense of uh, how many percent of firms will be allowed to return to normal, you know, to, to function? by May 12th, and what's the difference between May 12th and June the 4th in terms of the percentage of firms that may be allowed to, uh, you know, uh, return to uh, normal operations? Stefania? 
Hi there, Stefania from the EFT. Um, I had a couple of questions. The first being, uh, could you talk to us a little bit about the impact of uh, the outbreak among foreign uh, worker dormitories on uh, Singapore's economy so far, um, and also how you uh, see that envisioning for uh, in the next few weeks and months. Uh, and going back to uh, the uh, oil industry, and taking into account what you described as the first and second order effects uh, and also taking into account uh, that a very large player like uh, Hin Leong is facing the difficulties that it is at the moment. Um, can you talk to us more specifically about Singapore's oil sector? How worried are you about it at the moment? Potentially seeing more players Weaker, weaker and smaller ones running into trouble um, and essentially is this crisis that has exposed uh, another um, uh, let's say scandal among commodity traders here um, what are authorities also thinking or prepared to do to try and avoid um, uh, this happening again in the future okay uh, any other one final one before we take the Akil from TNA Digital. Akil. Yeah. Hi, Minister. Hi. Uh, just going back to the cohorting of migrant workers, um, you mentioned that the measures include you know, not mixing uh, together outside of work. In the dorms, it's pretty impossible because they live together and they're all from different companies. So how, how do you plan to, to, do, to do cohorting for the, the migrant workers in the dorms? Uh, should they all be decanted first to a separate um, a facility first? Or you know, yeah, just maybe talk to me about it. More about that. Thanks. Okay. Okay. Maybe I deal with the five questions. Okay. Uh, yes, the groups that you have highlighted are uh, indeed the groups that we are uh, more focused on testing them. These are the people who are working in our healthcare establishments and also the nursing homes uh, because they are dealing with uh, vulnerable uh, people in our community. So we have to be extra careful with them. Uh, the other group of people that, of course, will be uh, more concerned will be those with uh, frontline staff with a high degree of interaction with the public. And this will again be another group of people, a group of workers that we would want to be very careful with. So that's the high risk group of people. Uh, for Michelle, uh, yes, we are looking at the health schemes for the, those sectors that will need to restart later. And uh, we have already rolled out various schemes and we'll continue to review them as we go along and we'll consult the trade associations and chambers closely and also the businesses closely on how we can uh, progressively restart these various sectors. Uh, second, uh, you talk about the aviation. I think the PM has mentioned about this. Uh, we'll make sure that uh, SIA can continue to be a national icon in our economy and also to serve the wider regional uh, and global network. So that is our determination. Uh, just to give you an update, Michelle, on the tourism for the ASEAN uh, sector. Indeed, I just indeed I just had a meeting with my counterparts from the ASEAN sector, and one of the things that we talk about is that in the short to medium term, it is likely that domestic sec uh, domestic tourism will underpin the resumption. Will, will probably be the first part to start for the wider uh, revival of the tourism sector. Now, in order to do this, then. We need to teach. but in order for us to market ASEAN as an integrated package, we also need to make sure that we have the same uh, common health standard, cross border uh, health declarations and checks in order for us to be, uh, resume the uh, cross border travels. Uh, so, this is something that we need to work on. And you are right that given that the various ASEAN countries are at different stages of the happy curve. We will need to make sure that we put in place some of these measures that when the cases in the various ASEAN countries subside, then we can progressively resume the travel. But having said that, at this point in time, I think our focus is to make sure that instead of looking at the mass market, we will more more like essential uh, travel first. And that would give us confidence to work the processes for the cross-border travel, uh, which will take a longer time to resume. Uh, on the question on what's the difference now, 
uh, May 12th and June 4th. I think the, it will be premature for us to look at the numbers, uh, to give you the numbers at this point in time. I think, let me recap what we're going to do. From now till May 11th, we are asking the various companies to put in place the various measures and they will start to prepare now. Today, they will start to prepare now. As soon as they are ready by the 12th of May, then they can resume the work. And that number will depend on how many of them can use the next one week to make the necessary preparations to commence operations from uh, May 12th. And beyond that, uh, we will continue to progressively bring on board the other companies who can put in place those measures. So if you like, it is, uh, there is a phase uh, plan whereby different sectors will progressively be able to restart their operations once they put in place the safe measures necessary. So as to what numbers will we arrive at on May the 12th or June the 4th will very much depends on the ability of the various companies to put in place those measures uh, that we require. The safe work environment measures, the safe cohorting measures, uh, and the advisories on how to take care of their workers beyond their work environment. So at this point in time, we won't be able to give you that number, but as we progressively move through this, we'll be able to update you uh, just as we have done previously when we took on the different measures. Uh, on the foreign workers' impact on the economy, I think uh, for those sectors like construction, uh, offshore and marine that has a higher dependence on the foreign workers, I think they'll be more impacted by the uh, stay-home notices given to the workers in these two sectors. So it will take them uh, some time to get back on track and there'll be some delays in the projects. Uh, but for the rest of the sectors that are not so dependent on the foreign workers uh, in the dormitories, they will essentially be able to put in place the safe work measures and progressively restart their operations. Uh, and I just want to say that the Hinleong issues is not a reflection of the wider uh, situation in the Singapore oil trading market. Uh, I will not be able to comment on the Hinleong specifics at this point in time because uh, there are various investigations ongoing uh, behind the scene. But the Hinleong trouble is not a reflection of what is happening to the wider uh, oil trading market in Singapore. But the wider oil trading market in Singapore will, of course, certainly be impacted by what is happening uh, worldwide, which is that at this point in time, worldwide for the oil market, we are facing a uh, oversupply issue. And that's because the demand has fallen quite a lot in many countries uh, over the last couple of months. And the expectation is that the demand will continue to stay on a lower level and it will take some time before the recovery uh, takes place. So this is the common challenge that is uh, confronting all the major oil producers and also the global oil market at this point in time. Uh, for Akil, the last question is on the cohorting for the foreign workers. Yes, indeed, some companies have already started to do this. Uh, for example, many of the essential firms that have not stopped work during this entire period, many of the multinationals with global operations uh, that have not stopped work in this uh, period have already started making plans or have already executed plans to cohort their workers accordingly. So these are some of the good practices that we have picked up and we want to share this with the rest of the other companies that are going to resume their work. So it could be a combination of cohorting within uh, dormitories. It could be co uh, another idea is to cohort at different dormitories so that if anything happens to one particular group of workers from that company, the rest of the workers will not be uh, affected uh, so that they could be isolated from the rest of the workers. So that is how some of the companies from the uh, essential firms to some of the core uh, manufacturing firms and with global supply chains have done over the years, uh, over the last few months. I think we'll just take the last few yeah. questions. Uh, we'll just take the last few questions. Uh, yeah, hi, Minister. Um, Trinket from Asahi Shimbun. Uh, I have two questions. The 
Yeah, hello. The, I have two questions. The first question is regarding uh, RCEP, RCEP. So the yeah. COVID-19 has affected the uh, negotiation and um, all, all the things for RCEP. So do you think it's still possible for RCEP <clears throat> to reach substantial conclusion this year or even to sign it? Uh, That's mm-hmm. the first question. Second question is, just now you, uh, you answered about NDP, but what about F1? Because um, F1 is under MTI. So if yeah. F1 continues, right. um, how will you have social distancing? Okay. Okay. That's the last question. So I uh, uh, let me uh, need to get an uh, <coughs> update on the uh, RCEP. Uh, indeed, I had a very good discussion on Friday with my Japanese counterpart on uh, RCEP. I think at this point in time, uh, notwithstanding the COVID nineteen situation, the staff from the ASEAN Secretariat to all the ten, uh, all the fifteen countries are working very hard at the legal scrubbing, and we are on track on the legal scrubbing. Uh, what has happened over the last couple of days is that the ASEAN Secretariat and the 15 countries have made uh, an offer to India to see if they are prepared to rejoin the discussion in the coming month. Uh, If India is unable to rejoin the discussions in the coming month, then the plans will continue to proceed with the legal scrubbing for the preparation for the signing at the end of the year. Uh, At this point in time, we are still on track for the signing by the RCEP countries at the end of the year as directed by the leaders. So the work is ongoing. So uh, uh, although there's no physical meetings, in fact, the virtual meetings have been ongoing intensively behind the scene. So uh, at this point in time, we do not uh, foresee any uh, significant delay, but uh, we will of course have to see the developments in the coming months to see whether we can proceed with the meeting or we conduct the meeting in a different way. But what is uh, important is that in my discussions with my Japanese counterparts and also my counterparts from the other RCEP countries, everyone, everyone agrees that it is very important for us to sign the RCEP this year to boost the confidence of the global economy and the regional economy, especially in such a difficult moment. Uh, So when I talk to my various counterparts, I think they all realize that we need to do two things. We need to not just manage the current situation, which is the fallout from the COVID-19 pandemic, but we also need to give confidence for the longer term uh, economic prospect for our regional countries. And we need to do new things to allow our economies to recover and to grow. So some of these new things would include the regional agreements like the RCEP. Other things would include uh, the digital economy agreements which many countries are also concurrently exploring. And third, uh, many countries have now come on board to say that they want to sign the joint ministerial statement initiated by Singapore and New Zealand on maintaining the connectivity of the global supply chain. And as we see more and more countries coming on board, we we stay encouraged to say that uh, we have many like-minded countries that are not just playing defensive about managing the fallout from the COVID-19 situation, but they are also looking forward to plans to allow our economy to reach new heights going forward. So we are encouraged by that. Uh, on the F1 situation, I think the F1 is uh, still making its plans, uh, not just about Singapore, but for the worldwide, as particularly this season, and we are in close uh, consultation with F1, and we'll make the announce the resolution of that. Sharon. Sharon, yeah. Good morning, Minister. Uh, I'd like to ask some have actually warned of a possible second wave of infections after the first wave has stabilized. So in Singapore's case, if this happens, um, is there a chance that companies need to be prepared for another renewed set of circuit breaker measures even after the current ones have been lifted? And what do you expect the economic impact of this to be and how the government or companies be prepared for, for, for this? I'd also like to ask a second question uh, to clarify the reporting measures. How will this apply to companies that work in co-working or shared offices? Sorry, you repeat the second question again. Uh, oh, sure. Um, I'd like to clarify on the cohorting measures. How will this apply to companies that work in co-working uh, spaces or shared offices? Um, how will the, the, the cohorting be enforced given that, that they have many shared facilities? Thank you. Okay, so um, okay, so we, we take that as the last question. So uh, 
Your first question is very important. Your first question is precisely why we want to do the safe and sustainable measures. You see, many countries work on the following assumptions. That if we are not careful, there can be a flare-up again sometime down the road. And if every time there's a flare-up, then you go into another set of uh, circuit breaker measures, then you'll be very costly and inconvenient for the business community. The reason that we are putting in place the safe and sustainable measures is to make sure that we don't have this flare-up or at least to minimize the chances of this flare up uh, to the lowest possible. And this is why we call this the safe and sustainable measures. Safe for the workers that need to work on site, sustainable from a business perspective that these measures, even if it's prolonged, can be uh, done over time. So it is not about just taking all the measures suddenly and then just relaxing it uh, later. I think in a post-COVID situation, uh, we will have a new normal. And even during the COVID situation, we really do not know how long this will last. We have many experts from many countries giving uh, estimates that range from a few months to even more than one or two years. So we must be prepared for the long haul. We must make sure that our measures, when implemented well, can be sustainable for the long haul. And this is the philosophy behind how we intend to roll out these measures. So it is not a time-bound measure, it is not uh, it is an outcome-based measure. These are conditions that we think will allow us to return to work safely in a sustainable manner uh, over the long haul. And that is why we have introduced them. Uh, so the second question is that the co-working places, I think after this uh, current uh, COVID-19 situation, I think many of the business models for many of the companies will have to be re-evaluated and uh, it is still now an open question as to whether the co-working places uh, will be a sustainable model and if, it's, if it needs to make some adjustments, how we will need to make some adjustments. I don't think it is not possible to do a cohorting of workers even if you have uh, co-working spaces but it does require some uh, creativity on how we do this. Uh, over time. So I think this is something definitely the business owners for the uh, co-working places will have to think about going forward. Okay. So we'll just take one last question. Okay. Yeah. We'll just take one last question from Dylan. Dylan. From Nikkei. Dylan. Hi, uh, Minister. Can I just check with you, uh, with the trend uh, of the infections, they seem to be uh, heading downwards. Do you mm -hmm. have a timetable in mind for how you would like to see uh, the economy return to some sort of a normalcy or close to full capacity uh, pre-circuit breaker, uh, given that every day that uh, companies are not working um, at full capacity, they're taking points off uh, the GDP uh, numbers for Singapore. So uh, given what we're seeing right now, are we talking about a few weeks, a few months before we see maybe entertainment outlets resume, the rest of the sectors open up, uh, what's your timetable for this? I think it will be very difficult at this point in time to give a timetable. But let me go back to your other point first, which is uh, what are we targeting for? And we have said this uh, publicly. We hope to make sure that we bring down the community spread numbers to the single digits to the lowest possible. And uh, over the last few days, we have some encouraging news that indeed the community spread numbers have gone to the single digits. But this is one thing. If we can continue to sustain the very low numbers in the communities, right, it will give us greater confidence to progressively uh, open up uh, more sectors to recover uh, as near to full capacity as we possibly can, as you, you mentioned just now. So there will, the different sectors will have different economic uh, performance uh, outlook for the year going forward. So for example, in the biopharma, uh, in the global, uh, in the biopharma sector, in the many uh, precision manufacturing sectors where they are essential to the global supply chains, actually the businesses have gone up over the last couple of months. Then there will be some, the rest of manufacturing will take some time to recover because they 
depends very much on the global demand situation. And at this point in time, the global demand has fallen uh, from what it used to be a couple of months back. Then there'll be some other uh, sectors like what you mentioned, uh, those in the social uh, entertainment sector that will require a new business model of how we are able to operate in a COVID or post-COVID environment. The business model will need to change. And it is at this point in time, we will need to uh, encourage them to rethink the business model and we'll work with them to see how uh, in a post-COVID situation, some of these things can be resumed in a safe manner. So different sectors will require different approaches because of the nature of their work, the nature of their interactions with the public at this point in time. So I don't think uh, anybody anywhere in the world will have a full timetable, but what we must make sure is still the same thing. Make sure that we watch the situation closely, take measures ahead of time to make sure that there is no flare up of the situation in any parts of the economy. If there's any flare up, we must be able to quickly uh, find it, isolate the sector to allow the rest of the economy to continue to function. And I think this will be the modus operandi, if you like, of how things will progress in the next uh, few months, if not a year or two, because we will take some time to adjust to this new normal. And all of us will have to rethink the way we live and work to do this. Now, having said that, uh, if you go back to where I started with, in Singapore, we are quite fortunate that a large proportion of our economy allow people to work from home. So even prior to the circuit breaker measures, a substantial um, proportion of our people were able to work from home and allow our economic activities to continue to function. So that, I think, will continue to be so. What we are talking about uh, now and what we are focusing on now are those economic activities that cannot be done from home. Those require on-site work. And that is why we need to put in place those uh, safe distancing and safe overhead measures in order for work to restart progressively in a safe and sustainable manner.